Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today for this webinar. My name is Stefania Oliverio, and today I'd like to introduce you to a potential alternative blood biomarker for CO poisoning diagnosis. So first of all, I'd like to tell you where I come from. So uh, I work in Luxembourg, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, a uh, very small European country. You can see it in red in this picture, but let me help you out and zoom in so you can see it better. Uh, it's a small but a very strong country, and I work at the Laboratoire National de Santé, the National Health Laboratory, uh, which is in the south of the country, and I work as a forensic toxicologist. And uh, there I am part of the forensic medicine department, which is only one of the many departments of our laboratory uh, that work under the directory of the Ministry of Health. Now let's get back to uh, the main actor of this talk, which is uh, the silent killer. So as all of you know, CO is an odorless, tasteless and colorless toxic gas, and thus the name silent killer. So um, it is present in uh, exhaust fumes and gases from various indoor sources and outdoor sources. Uh, and these sources also contain other pollutants such as nitric oxides, ozone, particulate matter, and CO plays a more important role in enclosed spaces with uh, poor ventilation or during fires where it can accumulate faster and in higher concentrations. But no matter the source of the exposure, CO has been linked to various adverse health outcomes, uh, such as pulmonary, cardiovascular, and neurologic diseases. And it has been identified as an important cause for a big chunk of the global death burden. Now, quick reminder on how CO poisoning works. CO is inhaled through the lungs with air, just like when we breathe normally and uh, it reaches the bloodstream where it binds hemoglobin by displacing the oxygen. And why is that? Because of the around 200 times higher affinity that hemoglobin has for carbon monoxide as opposed to oxygen. Now, uh, carboxyhemoglobin is then transferred uh, to the tissues. I mean, uh, carbon monoxide is transferred to the tissues instead of oxygen. And depending on the time and amount of CO one is exposed to, different scenarios can be envisioned. So with high levels of CO, one is very likely to start rapidly feeling the effects of hypoxia and will soon be well, in need of a doctor or in worst cases, uh, death can occur. With low levels, uh, symptoms only start showing up very slowly and they're more challenging to actually associate with CO or associate to CO as the cause. But that doesn't mean that the effects aren't serious, quite the opposite. Uh, in the previous lecture, uh, Lucy Wilson actually showed us the adverse effects that low CO levels can have on the brain, but also other organs are impacted, uh, notably the heart and the lungs. And uh, the question now is how do we uncover the culprit? And well, in clinical settings, usually symptoms and a full medical history uh, can give indications to a doctor that CO is the cause. And this would then lead to several diagnostic tests to confirm the diagnosis. And in emergency departments, the most common way is to measure carboxyhemoglobin through a blood gas analyzer. However, due to the non-specificity of the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning, which you've seen before, they are headache, nausea, uh, uh, dizziness, so they can be related to many, many other diseases. And they are indeed often uh, confused and those symptoms are often mistaken for, for example, the flu or gastrointestinal problems, uh, meaning that we often um, carbon monoxide cases get misdiagnosed. In a forensic setting, uh, it is very important to determine the cause of death in order to direct the investigation, but also to be able to prevent further deaths from actually happening. And during an autopsy, this is done through markers of CO poisoning, which uh, you can see in this picture. 
it's a very uh, distinctive cherry red or bright pink lividity uh, that can uh, that is usually associated to CO poisoning. However, it can also be uh, seen in cases of hypothermia or cyanide poisoning. So it is specific, but not enough, let's say. Um, so therefore, confirmation is usually done through blood measurement of the blood biomarker, which is again carboxyhemoglobin. Now the question, how do we measure carboxyhemoglobin? Well, uh, as my slides are already showing you, the principle uh, of blood gas analyzer is spectrophotometry. Spectrophotometry is an analytical method that allows quantification of a substance in a solution. And this is done by measuring the difference in intensity of absorbed and transmitted light when a sample is placed in the path of a light source of a defined wavelength. So the quantification is possible because um, each substance absorbs more or less light at different wavelengths, thus generating a unique absorbance spectrum. And as you can see in this picture for the different hemoglobin moieties, uh, you can see that they have a very distinctive uh, and different spectrum at different wavelengths. So we can be able to distinguish one from another. And the analysis itself, I mean, the spectrophotometric analysis is very easy to perform and it doesn't really take much time. The problem with uh, spectrophotometric methods is that, um, well, they are dependent on the sample quality of the blood. And uh, therefore, there is a variety of analytical factors that can influence the analysis, such as exposure to air and also the volume of air present in the sampling container, the amount of oxygen present, storage temperature, and also whether there's high or low levels of CO already present. And in postmortem cases, you all have other phenomena that uh, occur um such as uh, coagulation when during especially during fire deaths uh, obviously high temperatures were reached which can lead to coagulation of the blood you have putrefaction you can have also some contamination from uh, well other bodily fluids so that's a problem for uh, post-mortem samples um furthermore a big issue has actually been the increased amount of reported cases where the level of measured COHB does not actually coincide with the symptomatology. Uh, so we have, you know, levels of COHB, but the symptoms so that the person is reporting are not in line with what you can see in the graph on the right, uh, which are the classic, uh, you know, this is like a classic CO uh, level to symptom graph. And uh, furthermore, uh, there's also been a number of cases where uh, there was a delayed onset of symptoms that took place, despite even having applied oxygen therapy to remove carboxyhemoglobin. And obviously this can lead to misdiagnosis, which can be very, very dangerous uh, if they're not, well, if it's not correctly diagnosed. And well, now the question was like, why is, are those inconsistencies uh, there? And the potential cause of these inconsistencies was found in the other less known uh, mechanisms of CO toxicity. They are not due to the effects of hypoxia or not only, but rather the direct cellular toxicity of carbon monoxide. As you can see in the picture on the right, uh, you can see that carbon monoxide also um, inhibits platelet aggregation, it disrupts the aerobic synthesis of ATP, and thus uh, leads to a decreased uh, mitochondrial fu function, to oxidative stress, can lead to myocardial injury. So all of those um, are caused by not actually only COHB, but by directly CO, which can be found as a free form in blood. And this raised the question, is there more CO than measured when we only measure carboxyhemoglobin? And if so, how much is it? And can it help explain these inconsistencies? So to answer these questions, we had a plan. And um, 
we identified, well, we first of all wanted to use a different analytical method that is more accurate, robust, and specific than uh, spectral photometry. And we identified it as gas chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. Um, in very basic terms, gas chromatography is a technique to separate molecules present in a gaseous sample through a chromatographic column. And uh, the separated molecules are then sent into the mass spectrometer where they are, uh, based on their mass to charge ratio, they are measured. And this allows us to precisely identify them and quantify all the molecules present in our sample. So with this in mind, we wanted to develop a new technique to determine, um, uh, to basically quantify the total amount of CO in blood and renamed this uh, TBCO and compare this to carboxyhemoglobin. And we wanted to um, also determine the stability of these two biomarkers uh, during storage conditions, both from a qualitative and quantitative uh, point of view. Now let's see what uh, how we did it and what happened. So uh, in the sake of time, I'm not going into the details of the method, but what you need to know is that uh, the method is very simple. Uh, in an airtight vial, we use a small blood sample where uh, we release all of the carbon monoxide present through a chemical reaction that takes place inside the vial. And uh, we then sample one milliliter of uh, the gas generated and inject it into the uh, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And uh, the analysis uh, runs for about four minutes and the preparation takes around one hour. And uh, this method was then validated according to scientific guidelines. And the next step was obviously to apply it to real cases. Um, the first study that we applied it to was a cohort of 13 patients uh, that were administered CO up to 10% with a CO rebreathing device. I think that Lucy in her uh, her lecture actually talked about a device. I think it must have been a similar one that was used here. And um, we were able to get samples before and after exposure. And of the two samples that uh, were taken after exposure, one was used uh, as it was, and the other one was actually flushed with a stream of inert gas. In this case, it was nitrogen gas in order to basically remove the excess or the free CO. So the idea was to use the stream of nitrogen to remove the free CO in order to only have the CO bound to hemoglobin and measure it, and to use the other sample without flushing to measure the total amount of CO. And we analyzed all samples via CO oximetry to measure COHB and to measure TBCO with uh, GCMS or just carbon monoxide with GCMS. Now to the results, uh, I know this graph looks scary and complicated, but I'm gonna help you through it. Basically on the left, you can see this is the axis for TBCO, which is represented by the bars. On the right, you see the axis for COHB, which is represented by the dots. Now um, to the colors, green is the sample before exposure, blue and orange are the bars after exposure. Now, what do you need to look at? Uh, first of all, you can see that the blue and orange bars and dots are always higher than the green ones. So that means that the administered CO actually did reach the bloodstream it bound uh, to hemoglobin. And so we managed to actually see it. So that's already good. So the CO rebreathing device worked. Uh, but the important thing that you need to look at now is that the blue bars are always higher than the orange bars meaning that not uh, that the not flushed samples, uh, the blue ones, uh, have more CO than the orange flushed samples. So basically we're saying that uh, we have a certain amount of free CO that we were able to quantify. And through a statistical test, we wanted to determine whether it was uh, statistically significant and we could indeed confirm that there was statistical significance in these differences, which is a huge result for us because we were able to 
for the first time actually quantify this amount of free CO and to actually determine that it was significant. Um, then we went on and uh, applied the method to uh, post-mortem cases. You can see here a list of uh, cases with their cause of death and the post-mortem interval. So for those of you who don't know, the post-mortem interval is the interval between the time of death and the, in this case, the autopsy. So basically the body was recovered and then was uh, arrived in the morgue and was uh, immediately autopsied and samples were taken right away. And uh, this is important because, as I mentioned before, you have postmortem phenomena that can lead to alterations of the results. Therefore, the earlier you can get samples, uh, the better it is. And here you see the results. Uh, you can see that um, um, measured CHB concentrations, you can see them in red, whereas in blue, you have the measured TBCO, which uh, was actually back calculated uh, to COHB through a formula that was found in the literature. And uh, you can see that uh, for all cases, again, you have more TBCO than COHB. And what is very interesting here as well is that in cases four and five, no COHB was measurable. That's because of the poor quality of the blood sample. Uh, but TBCO was measurable and we were able to actually associate it with a CO poisoning case. So that was also very interesting and very useful for us to find out. The third part of the study, well, we were investigating the storage uh, parameters and the effects they would have on CO concentrations. We have uh, fortified uh, uh, blood uh, blank, obviously CO free blood samples from that we obtained from cows because that was the easiest, uh, the most easy to access and also in big quantities. And uh, we analyzed COHB with CO oximeter and CO with GCMS. And the measurements were performed over a period of one month on uh, following days. The idea was that we basically uh, fortified the, this blood with uh, CO and then uh, stored it with different parameters that I'm going to show you now and did the analysis over one month. So here are the preservatives, uh, the, the parameters that we investigated. So we investigated different preservatives. So we have EDTA, heparin, sodium fluoride, and uh, what am I, I'm missing one. Uh, anyway, um, we then investigated also different storage temperatures. We investigated whether, what I'm, what I'm saying with headspace volume is that basically the amount of air that is in, a, in the blood tube. So whether basically your blood tube is filled as much as possible or not. We also investigated freeze and thaw cycles. We investigated whether reopening and closing the tubes would actually make a difference. And also whether different CHP concentrations would have an impact. Now, uh, which parameters now did or did not lead to concentration changes? Well, results showed that for COHB, uh, concentrations were only stable when preserved with EDTA and when stored in the freezer and with a filled blood tube. Uh, I mean, basically a blood tube that was filled as much as possible. So with, with uh, the less amount of uh, air volume. And uh, however, concentrations changed over time. For TBCO, concentrations were generally stable uh, over time and showed stability when they were preserved with um, uh, in the fridge or in the freezer, uh, preserved with EDTA. And uh, no matter what, if the blood tube was filled or not, uh, the concentrations shown were stable. And important for both of them was that neither freeze and thaw cycles nor multiple reopening did have an impact on the concentration. So at least from that point of view, we know that uh, the analysis is not going to be impacted. Now, the verdict, what did all of these studies actually tell us? Um, well, um, first thing is that we have now validated uh, a novel approach, and we have successfully done so, to measure carbon monoxide in blood, and we have applied it to both clinical and postmortem settings. 
and uh, TBCO has shown to be more stable during storage and as well as well as less prone to alterations from analytical factors compared to carboxyhemoglobin. Furthermore, TBCO was shown to be more accurate uh, in determining the real amount of CO present in blood samples, and this can potentially help in decreasing the misdiagnosis. Now, obviously, there's more work to be done, and one of these things related to the last point that I made is that obviously we need TBCO reference values, so we need to find cutoffs and, you know, try to find... Uh, correlation either with the COHP values or with the symptoms. So basically try to see whether we can, you know, correlate what uh, patients are reporting with those TBCO values. And to do that, well, we need more samples and uh, to be able to get more samples, we need collaboration with other labs because as mighty as Luxembourg might be, it's still a small country and the number of cases we would get is not uh, very high, both clinical and postmortem. Therefore, there's currently a lot of uh, collaboration projects uh, in discussion or ongoing. For clinical samples, um, I am actually talking to the, well, still the, uh, Centre Hospitalier de Luxembourg, which is the main uh, hospital in Luxembourg. So we should be able to make a collaboration with them. And I've also talked to Lucy, um, trying to see whether we can join forces on RCO projects and whether I could get access to their samples as well, since they're using a similar, uh, the similar, the similar rebreathing, CO rebreathing device. For postmortem cases, I've actually already received and analyzed many samples from uh, Switzerland, but also from our neighbors in Belgium. So I've uh, been doing some public public work, public relations work, and trying to get collaborations, and that seemed to have worked quite well. So I've done a lot of analysis of those. However, I have not yet finished my data analysis so hopefully i'll actually be able to update you on these projects very soon and what you need to know is that the work is in progress and hereby i come to the end of my presentation i would like to thank adrian for inviting me to speak today and i also would like to thank uh, the co research trust for because they actually funded my phd project i mean most of what you've heard today was actually part of my PhD project. And so thank you for them for funding it. And of course, thank you all for your attention and uh, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or just wanna say something, give your opinion, I'm open for anything. So thank you very much.